the other thing that I wanted to say is we want to make sure that you all are being as interactive as possible. Uh, you know, we're, we're not up here to say this is how it's going to be. We're going to roll out some uh, high-level concepts. We want to see the head nods. We want to see the shakes of the heads. We want to see the questions. We want to see the, hey, have you thought about that? So that, that way, you know, as we're starting to refine some of these key concepts, that we've got, I'll say, general buy-in or general consensus, or at least some questions for us to be considering as we're moving forward. So we're going to go ahead and start. We've got a uh, pretty full agenda when I say that uh, as it relates to the presentation itself. Uh, with me today, for uh, those who don't know me, remember I'm Kelly Clinton. I'm with Kinley Horn, and I'm our team's project manager working directly with the city on the update of your comprehensive plan. Uh, the tall gentleman in the jacket is Mike Votto, planner with uh, my team. And the other gentleman over here is James Taylor, not to be confused with the senior, although I have heard him bell tell a song or two. Uh, but he is our transportation and mobility uh, expert. So we're going to be talking about a couple things today, so just to go ahead and dive right in. From uh, today's discussion, we're going to be giving you some highlights as it relates to the future land use element. Mobility element, that's going to be the first change you're going to be thinking about and here go away. Mobility, what are we talking about? Uh, the recreation and open space element, and then again, I'll say the, the end discussion. Now, we're not saying to say wait till the very, very end with your comments. You know, if you've got a question on the way, go ahead and stop this. Just keep in mind that we may say, we're actually going to cover that in the next slide, or start saying, okay, we've got 40 more slides to go through, let's come back to that. So. Raise the hands, ask the questions, be as interactive as you want to be, need to be, or think to be. And at the same time, we'll try to answer those questions as we go along. So, one of the things I always like to do before every meeting, whenever we're talking about a conference and plan, is just to remind everybody what the conference and plan is not. It is not to be a series of codes. Your land development code and land development regulations, zoning code, all has that language in there. So the comprehensive plan is the plan. It sets the vision for what we're doing. Subsequent to this, which is going to be your all's charge at the end of the day, which is to update the city's development standards. We identify the broad-based policies. We give you the guidance. And we start getting into the nuts and bolts as far as is a parking space 10 feet wide by 18 or is it 10 by 20. That doesn't come up in the comprehensive plan. So we'll keep that uh, in the back of our minds as we're moving forward. So the future land use element. Can you hold on one second? Absolutely. Sure. I, I think it's important. I'm John Drury. I'm the city administrator. Uh, I'd like to do two things before you dive into it. One is to have everybody introduce themselves at that, that's at this table. And uh, just really quickly about, um, you know, kind of your role and views very quickly on the uh, uh, Tamara. So let's start off with our planning and zoning chair. Here is the process for planning and zoning. Uh, my vision for the city is to keep the city moving forward, but listen to the message. Thank you. Luke? Luke Bleas, Vice uh, Chair for Planning and Zoning. Uh, my vision is to maintain the quality of life that we have. Uh, while moving forward as well, we have to grow. If we don't grow, we will perish. We just have to grow carefully uh, and make sure we use the land we have properly. Thank you. Hold on one second. Susie, are you taking minutes? I am. Okay. Vance, thanks for filming this. This is good stuff. Roy. Roy Stevenson, City Council. Uh, I'm not going to say anything different than anyone else. We're going to keep moving forward. There's no stopping it at this point. Uh, I think we should look at water quality. I think that's important like, for the fishing capital of the world here in Florida. So, I think we should focus on water quality. Robert Wolf. Uh, Robert Wolf, city uh, resident.
density and the floor of the cavern. I'm Trevor Hall, I'm from Spires in Orlando. I represent uh, Loma Linda, which owns about 300 acres here in Lake in, in Tiberi. Thank you for being here. Uh, Nicholas Stack, I'm a small business owner here. Um, most interested in uh, maintaining the character of this area. Um, I believe it's a very beautiful place to live. And I, I wanted to stay that way even though this growth will be coming. Great. Freddie Belt. Freddie Belton and my son Chris is outside now. <laughs> Very tall. So uh, I'm a uh, property owner here and business owner in Tavares. areas. Unfortunately, live in Mount Dora and love to live here. Sorry. And just keeping an eye on uh, city people and everything, make sure you guys are doing the right thing. But let me tell you, as far as I'm concerned, you've been doing a great job and I appreciate you having all the meetings and well, keeping things for going here. moving forward. Tracy. Good morning. My name is Tracy Anderson. I'm the Parks Management Supervisor. I'm here also on behalf of James Dillon, the Public Works Director. And it's our mission in the Parks Division to take care of our parks, our open spaces, the integrity of our water, by how we maintain those properties with good stewardship and programs and training for our employees. Bob Tweedy. I'm Bob Tweedy, the Economic Development Director for the city. Uh, and it's, uh, it's my job to make sure that we uh, enhance and maintain and enhance the quality of life uh, with economic viability in the community, uh, sustained growth. Growth is inevitable. It's happening. It's Florida. It's the fastest growing place in the country. It's how we manage that and make sure that we really uh, keep the tax base strong and, and continue to grow sustainable, good jobs, stable jobs for our community. Susie Novak is our clerk. She's taking minutes of this meeting. Um, let's uh, just introduce uh, some of the residents that are here. Uh, start out with you, sir. Thank you for being here. Mr. Belton? I'm here following. Okay. He's going to take over sometime. Hopefully, okay. more sooner than that. <laughs> Changing the guard. Denise Morata. Just an interested resident. I've lived here for about 15 years, and I'm interested in seeing the city move forward with the same progress it has in the past. Mike. Mike Fitzgerald, the Community Development Director. Uh, I'll be taking all of this input and reviewing the comp plan and making sure that we. To it and that Tiberius keeps moving forward with its growth. Troy. Uh, yes, I'm Troy Singer, uh, city council member, currently serving as mayor. Uh, just love to see everybody participate in this process. Uh, I love what I'm hearing from everybody. Uh, city of Tiberius is in a great spot. I just like all of you want to see us uh, continue to move forward. And I think uh, you know this is the process that will help us do that. Antonio Fabre, I work for the Community Development Department. I'm Mike Can't hear you. My name is Antonio Fabre. I work for the Community Development Department. I'm Denise uh, Mike Fitzgerald. I'm the one who take this information and we implement the uh, comprehensive plan and the zoning map. So we're going to take this information that we're going to update now, the comprehensive plan, and make sure that land development is consistent with what we're doing now. Thank you. <coughs> Blogger. That's it. <laughs> FiscalRangers.com. This will be on YouTube in a day or two. All right. Uh, you're, you're introduced your team. Uh, and you know that I'm the city administrator. And I just want to kind of say this. Uh, this is a committee that was put together by the city council to review in more detail the comprehensive plan and share your opinions and ideas. From the comprehensive plan, land development codes will be built. Comprehensive plan is for 20 years. You are setting the future of the berries for the next 20 years. And those land development codes are what all investors in the berries will use to guide them on what they can do with their private property. And we all know about private property rights and government. It can be Conflicting. Neighbors get involved, governments get involved, private property owners get involved, and 
And Florida has figured out a way to create a balance between private property rights, government, and neighbors through the comprehensive planning process, which create land development uh, laws that everybody must abide by. This is like a really important deal for Tavares. And you guys are the boots on the ground. You're the ones that we're going to take this information, bring it into the conversation, and not everybody's going to agree. And then it will get shepherded to the planning and zoning board, and then it'll get shepherded to the city council. Public input will be heard, and then they're going to vote and adopt a comp plan for the next 20 years and build land development regulations on that. And all future decisions will be based on that. Thank you for taking time out of your day for being here. I've asked this guy not to preach to you too much and to get your input more than us uh, talking to you. Hopefully we'll have a good balance in that area. As, uh, I'm very interested to hear. I'm not on this committee. Uh, Mike's not on this committee. We're, we're back here taking notes and listening to you. Our, our job is to take this, working with a consultant, and make sure it goes through an open government process with public input, and it's codified into law. Uh, so that's where we're at. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it back to you. I just thought it was important that everybody knew what we were up to and who was here, and to thank you all for being here. So just to kind of echo something that John said, you know, thank you especially for coming out on the Wednesday afternoon uh, during the workday. That is shows a lot of commitment to this process, and we do appreciate it. It goes a long way, especially with the, with the team we have. Uh, and there again, as we're talking, raise your hand. Ask us the questions. We'll try to answer them. I will tell you that there are some things we probably won't be able to answer, and we will have to come back to you. But at the end of the day, we want to try to get as much of this information out so that you're uh, educated, understanding what we're doing, so when you see the next iterations and versions, you're like, ah, that's what we all discussed, and that's what we kind of shepherded at that point. So, one of the things that we're going to kind of do is we're going through these kind of key components today, just these three elements. Uh, please keep in the back of your mind, one, we're not going to go line by line with each policy, and two, we're not hitting all nine elements of the comprehensive plan. We're hitting on the big ticket items today because those are the ones that have tendency to shape what we do with other components. So, from a future land use perspective, and we're going to do this with each uh, today's section. We're going to talk about centerpieces. What are those big ticket items that really are, I'll say, kind of significant changes or a deviation from the status quo? So, you know, this isn't saying that this is the only things that we're editing or amending at the end of the day. Of course, we have our statutory components that we have to deal with and address through the Florida statutes for comp plans. But where we've identified other things, where we've heard from the workshops, where we've heard from the, the previous community uh, input, we went back and said, okay, what are the kind of the five, six things in the future land use that we want to make sure we're really diving into with this committee? So we'll go through each of these, but basically there's going to be, we're proposing or thinking about a consolidation of certain land use designations. Why? You've got a lot of them out there right now, but a lot of them do almost the exact same thing. So our thought was, let's we'll throw it out there and we'll see if it, you know, if you're comfortable with that, and we'll kind of go through uh, the three that we're talking about today and why. The mixed use consolidation, that's part of that discussion as well. We'll go into a lot of detail on that one. The future land use map. Now, depending on what we hear, the first two items will actually kind of guide us towards the, the map at the end of the day. The residential land use, uh, residential state land use, this is actually a brand new land use designation that we heard loud and clear from these folks saying, We've got that missing link, so to speak, between properties that are in the county to certain areas within that may be in the city or right beside. So we were challenged at the last few meetings, come up with something that kind of bridges that gap and gives us a transition. Compatibility. Everybody talks about is this piece of property or this development compatible with this other piece of property. So we're trying to give the, the city some options and some tools to move forward. Annexation policy. Uh, that was pretty self-evident. And then uh, seaplane base. And you may be thinking, seaplane base with the land use? I would tell you that the seaplane base actually crosses about four different elements of the city's comprehensive plan because it is a land use. It is a transportation mobility. It's actually linking a lot of your key civic and recreational components as well. 
and you know, playing off of the city's economic development strategy that was done, which I would say was very well done. We're trying to incorporate those types of policies into it at this point. So. I'm mute there. <laughs> so. So right now, as it stands, this is the city's existing future land use map, which is um, also depicted over there on the easel. Um, again, so this is this is the current adopted map. And so, like Kelly said, um, from here was a good segue into kind of talking about some of those select future land use designations that we are again throwing out there to the group um, for feedback on on consolidating these. So the first of which would be. <coughs> Uh, suburban expansion, which has a, um, a, a density of up to uh, four dwelling units per acre, and you have your low density designation, which is up to 5.6 dwelling units per acre. So, as you can see here um, on the map, uh, the suburban expansion designation takes up about you know, approximately seven acres. So, again, throwing it out there, we're proposing consolidating these two future land uses. Uh, again, to reiterate what Kelly said, uh, to reduce the number of categories, and, uh, and clean things up a little bit. So here's uh, where the suburban expansion of land use can be seen on your existing future land use map, and I have to circle it, so it's right there. Um, this is where the low density future land use is on your current map. And here's what it would look like with them consolidated, again, um, it would be essentially changing that um, piece right there. So, so before we go into the next little bit, I was going to ask, does, does, does everybody understand what we're talking about when we're saying we're going to consolidate and where that actually falls on the map? So the last thing I want to do is have somebody not understand and then they kind of walk away here going, well, I didn't, I didn't understand that at all. Yeah, I can go back here to this, this slide here too. So, so essentially kind of what we're saying is, your total acreage of low density future land use would be this new number here with combining those two. And if you think about it, uh, you're going from six acres at four to six acres at 5.6. So you're talking about a very, very minimal increase. So one of the things you're going to hear today is also, are, are you also all okay with some of those increases? And we'll walk through those. So just in a general sense, Everybody okay with that kind of line of thinking at this point? Any additional thoughts? Where are those boundaries? The back, that map is not very clear. I don't know which one you're talking about. Sure, yes sir. So right here is the, the property that is designated as suburban expansion at that 4.0 uh, dwelling units per acre. So on the current map, there's about seven acres at that designation. Um, and again, like we were saying, Low density is at 5.6, so what we're proposing is making that the land that's currently suburban expansion, rolling that into the low density land use designation. So it's all those brown spots you're saying? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So uh, all these that are shaded brown are have a future land use category of low density. Right, right now? Right now. So we're, we're not talking about changing those, we're just showing where the, the consolidation would actually occur, which is that six and a half acres, almost seven and a half acre piece of property. Right, so in, in this in this potential scenario, only seven acres would, would have a, a different category of line. Okay, so on to the next one. The next one we looked at was your moderate density future land use and your medium density future land use. Again, these are very close in the allowable density, uh, moderate at 10 dwelling, uh, up to 10 dwelling units per acre, and medium up to 12 uh, dwelling units per acre. So as you can see, we kind of calculated the, the acreage here. So currently there's 123 acres um, with the moderate uh, future land use designation, uh, 483 uh, with the medium designation. And again, we're throwing it out there is combining these two, um, where uh, what is what now has a moderate designation would have a medium at up to 12. So if, if we went this route, there'd be a little over 600 total acres um, with the medium density designation. So where's the map showing where that would be? So that's right, that's next year, sorry, one second. 
So right now is what is on the, uh, on the map currently um, at the moderate uh, density, uh, at the up to 10 dwelling units per acre. So uh, down here and up there. Uh, this next map is the existing uh, map showing uh, the medium density designations. And these uh, have a level of density up to 12 on this right here. And here's the proposed map showing all of those lands as uh, with the medium designation. So one of the things that uh, somebody was talking about earlier said, you know, the increase in density. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons why we're looking at the districts that we're doing. One is you're talking about existing designations that are roughly 1 to 3% of the total of the city. So, so basically designations that are very rarely used. So the idea was, okay, we can add a little bit more to it. There's only a little bit more density, but more importantly, what we're doing is trying to combat, combat sprawl at the same time. And that kind of goes to the root of all of this. And, oh, by the way, when James is talking about transportation, we can accommodate all of this density without uh, or intensity without uh, impacting negatively impact on your transportation system. All of these are in the city. So it's not in the county. Correct. Great question. Did everybody hear the question? Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's the other thing. If somebody has a question and you didn't hear it, just raise your hand and we'll repeat the question. Okay, so we'll move on. Uh, the next is um, on to mixed use. Um, so this will will be a little bit more in-depth discussion. So currently, the city has two mixed-use future land use categories. One, mixed-use neighborhood. Uh, one is mixed-use commercial. Uh, mixed-use neighborhood has a uh, allowable residential density up to 12 million units per acre. Mixed-use commercial up to 25 million units per acre. Uh, both have a, um, a range of allowable non-residential um, square footage as well. Uh, so again, um, looking at the map here, um, the mixed-use neighborhood designation is about 138 acres, uh, mixed-use commercial uh, about 230, and again, throwing it out there, consolidating these two as one single mixed-use future land use, uh, which would encompass um, around 368 acres throughout the city, uh, and, in, and in particularly important areas as well. Is there a floor area uh, limit or anything with regard to the non-residential? Yeah, actually we do have that. We're going to show that in just a second. But right now the, the, the city's current land use designation has this kind of, I'm going to say scattershot of uh, floor area ratio. So how much square footage can be built? So one of the things we're going to show you and ask your opinion on is do we want to try to simplify that and make it just a flat number instead of having these different tiers or different things. Uh, I will tell you that your mixed use designations have a very low standard for commercial and office as compared to other urbanized areas in other cities. So that's that's one of the things that we were looking at as well. Uh, most places that we work with and talk to have the one designation and you have multiple zoning districts that you implement with. So there you go. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Will we have access to that PowerPoint presentation? The, the city, uh, city clerk does have uh, this information as well, so yes. It will be emailed to the city clerk once we wrap up here uh, this morning. Uh, so here's the, um, and, and actually I do have these, these printed out in the 11 by 17 format, so we can pass those around if it's, if it's easier to see um, after we get through these. So right, right now on the screen, we're showing the existing lands with the mixed-use neighborhood future land use designation. So these are this pink here, uh, the northwest section of the city, uh, just north of downtown here, and on the east, uh, east part of the city right there. Uh, this next map is the existing mixed-use commercial uh, designation. Um, those are these right here. 
right here downtown, um, up by the hospital. And so this next map is showing if we were to consolidate these into one single mixed-use designation, this is what the map would look like. So there would be... Yeah, let me, let me go back to the, the gentleman asked the question about what about the four area ratios. One of the things that uh, is also in there, I mean, literally what we're talking about is your current standards have uh, basically anywhere between 0.1 uh, FAR, so basically 10% of the site could be a building, up to about 35, in some cases 45% of the site could be for a building. Uh, there again, that is that's very much more, it's, it's, it's more closely akin to like a, a, a suburban or a rural standard. Uh, the other thing it does, it actually says if you're commercial, you get your this. If you're office, you do this. So when we first read it, we were like, okay, this is a little confusing. So there again, it's kind of a, a little bit more of a radical change. So it, what is, where, do you, where does this, this committee kind of fall at this point? Some additional thoughts or questions. My first thought is that it's not expansive enough. That mixed use should be from the lakefront all the way up to 441 over to 19 for the whole floor of downtown. That's my first opinion. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't get density downtown, you're not going to be able to pay your bills. We do have a commercial downtown land use that does allow density, so that the commercial downtown is specifically for downtown. Okay, that would be an addition to this? It would be an addition to it, yes, okay. and then mixed use is an extension of that. Okay. I'll bring this over so it's closer to the microphone. <laughs> I really like that comment. Uh, what's, what's everybody else think? Still not enough land, still needs to be a little bit more? as far as just a generalized area. And, and I will say we did look at the city's economic development strategy, looking at some of those uh, targeted generator areas uh, that you all have, to try to bury some of this up as well. Because you've got like the hospital and some of your industrial park and some of the other things. Those are perfect areas to expand or you know, enhance the, the mixed use areas themselves. up a little bit more on this mixed use category. Maybe. Alright, let's take a, a five minute break. We have lunch here. Come on up and grab it. Enough for everybody. Uh, grab one of those and bring it back to your table and then we'll let you uh, finish, you know, continue the working lunch. If you're hungry, grab one of those, take it. He's going to make your money, which means he's going to bring up something. So one of the things that we also wanted to look at was because the current designations for mixed use are very regimented and basically says thou shall be at 50% commercial and 50% residential in certain areas or it's got to be 40%. Now, especially for our developers and business owners, how specific and precise can you be if you're trying to create a, you know, build your building or do that and say, oh, I can only use like half of my building for residential and half for commercial. That, that works with my business plan. Anyone? I just tend to prefer that which is not quite so prescriptive. Okay. And, and, and I'm going to assume if somebody doesn't make a comment or eating, so just give me the hint and I'll... Yes. Yes, sir. I've uh, passed on to Mike uh, something I saw. Global's got a thing right now where a similar process. They were showing me some examples from Salisbury, Georgia. We have three story structures in the core of town, or a lot of four doors, where the first floor is designated commercial, but if the commercial's not there yet, you'll have to be resident. <laughs> so flexibility, and I agree with Trevor that you know, less prescriptive and more, you've got to work within the 
what makes money for me. I love that, and here's the question I want to ask you all. Market changes, do those occur pretty regularly, or is it pretty much locked in that, oh, yeah, we're going to continue on this trend for a long, long time? No. It changes a little, just a little bit. So what we've said is, okay, at the same time that we're trying to consolidate some of these areas, and I love your comment again about let's expand those areas so we will look at that, is let's make it more flexible because what you may have as part of your business plan is going to be different than somebody else's. So let's give you the range. If you're able to, you know, as long as you get a certain percent of residential, you know, don't go below that number, but don't go above a certain number so that, you know, mixed use to be mixed use. It should have residential, commercial, office, whatever. But don't be so prescriptive to where we say, if you want to come in and you're at 40%, we're just throwing that out. And that number may be lower or whatever else. If you wanted to be 40% residential and 60% commercial, great, perfect. Let's help you accommodate that. The flip side, if you wanted to be 60% residential and only 40%, the other, great. You still keep going. Instead of that, especially at this early, early stage of thou shall be right here, let's give you the sandbox to play in. And oh, by the way, let's look at the densities and intensities. And we still want to look at that uh, non residential square footage option to say uh, one of the mixed use commercial or uh, mixed use uh, that you see is actually up to 25 right now. Uh, so, you know, if, if you're all thinking, hey, we might want to hit, but bump that density up, there's ways to do that. I think the whole percentage is out all ahead of it. The only thing I will say is what we've seen is if it's a mixed use and you don't have some level of, of ratio in there, somebody will come in and do 100% residential and you just lost that commercial component. That's the only thing I would say, yes. But most of that. I agree with you, it's going to be driven by the market, but we're driving the market. We have graphics. What is moving into the area? What is the demand of the people moving in the area? That's what's going to drive that. So you can say, yeah, I want to do this, I want to do that. But if the people that are moving in the area don't want that, then it's got to be able to show. And you, you all currently have residential land use, you have commercial land use. So you do have that, you've got the three slick of stool at this point. So if somebody wanted to do straight up residential, that tool is there. If somebody wanted to do straight up commercial, that tool is there. The idea is, you know, where do where you identify mixed use that really, you know, we're not asking to get rid of what's on the ground today and that those options. We're just trying to refine it, make it more flexible, more, more user friendly. Yes, sir. I know that when I started buying property in Tiberias, which is probably, four years ago, my idea was that in the next 15 years, things are things are going to change. And in my mid 20s, I remember going to a city council meeting and the guy and I was saying, listen, Sinclair Avenue, one of the main thoroughfares downtown. So to prove me wrong, they put a stop sign there, which I don't know how many of y'all remember that. They put a stop sign on Sinclair. And after about three or four wrecks, they decided to open it back up. But that's exactly what was happening. So, Long term, it, it, it's tough to say, okay, this, let's set it up this way and we're going to leave it there because you don't know what's going to happen. And it's take, there's still property in downtown DeBerry, as everybody knows, where it hadn't been improved in the last 40 years. And it built in the 70s, and I think there are people waiting to retire to sell it and hoping that somebody's going to come in and make something of it. So it, it's. It, even if you're looking 20 years down the line, it's going to be tough to, to uh, come up with a single plan. What else? Okay. So we'll go back and we'll sit down with staff and we'll talk through some of that as far as the mixed use is concerned. But I, I appreciate the comment I like that. So we've got those couple that we'll definitely be looking at. Uh, this one may get, you know, may go, oh, okay, now we're going to do that. Um, again. So typically when you see a mixed use, what you're trying to do is get away from the status quo. So almost like a planned development. Now, most people automatically see more basic and they go, nope, not only no, but no. 
Now, the thing I will tell you is, one size does not fit all when it comes to a form-based code. If you look at a form-based code, or even just the principles of a form-based code, uh, all across the country, those vary. We've seen everything from what we call traditional or the Euclidean zone, which is, you know, you've got a minimum setback of 50 feet, uh, your buildings are set back certain areas or certain heights. Form-based code principles would allow you to start to modify some of those standards and create some, some, have some creativity when it comes to your development form. Now, the city, as part of their code update, could go, okay, we want to look at where the buildings are placed, where the parking is, and architecture, and leave it at that. Some people will go, well, no, but a form-based code says you've got to, you, you can't look at uses, and I would say that's incorrect. It can be whatever you want to be. It just becomes down to a different form to where you're not segregating uses, segregating buildings, you're not saying you're pushing things all the way back. And you start basically you almost look at what's going on in the downtown right now, where the buildings are situated, where the parking is situated, and start applying some of those principles to other development areas. So there again, it's more of a if you give a high level I don't think anyone really knows, and I've never fully comprehended, form-based codes versus traditional codes. Perfect question. Thank so you. What do we have today, and what's the difference between form-based codes and traditional codes? And I'd love to hear your input, because they're totally different. So, so high so level, the difference. Traditional Both. codes? What do we have today? Traditional code is kind of like the public shopping center down south. You've got a building that is set way far back off the road. Now, of course, Publix is not a good example because they have a certain amount of area that they, they like to have in front of the parking. But it says, you know, your building has to be at least 100 feet back from the edge of the road. It has to be no less than 50 feet off the rear. It can only be 35 feet, and it can only be these sets of uses and this type of signage. Boom. Done. A form-based code, or what we like to use more appropriately as a hybrid, is to say, instead of all buildings being all set back at a certain distance, we, allow, we look at flexibility. Can some be closer to the road? Can some be further back? Can you share the parking? Can you get creative with some of the signage? Can you look at some architectural features that can help make that building interact better with the street itself? So if you think about it, what is developed in downtown? is, I'll say, the far end, extreme, I'm not going to say extreme, but the far end of what a form-based code could look like. Suburban components, those are more traditional. And there again, you can use as much or as little as you want, but the thing is, as a city, you should be able to say, hey, if we're going to do this commercial area, we would like for the buildings to interact better than just being standalone at that point. All right, so just to summarize what I think you said is, we have traditional codes with the barriers. Setbacks, square footage, height, traditional codes. Form based codes are squishy, architectural, in nature, very squishy. Question Do you prefer to keep the current traditional standard codes or do you interest in form based codes? Is that one of the questions you're asking? Absolutely. Hey, I'm very interested to hear what the community feels about form-based codes versus traditional codes. And I will say form-based codes, I'm still wrapping my head around what it really means, but he just attempted to do it. So why don't we just go around real quickly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, who wants to start off? I've had some experience um, in Pine Castle, Orange County, trying to figure out what form-based codes are all about. All about. And to me, what it means is that they want the matching of the building to be appropriate for the street and that sort of thing. So if I owned a three-story unit there, I could have a guitar studio on the first floor, I could live on the second floor, and I could have a lockout separate unit on the third floor. And as long as the transportation system was appropriately set up and that guitar studio could have an awning off the front where you could have sidewalk seating or whatever, because the regulations don't govern the use so much, they just they govern the size, massing of the building, placement within the block, and that sort of thing. So form-based codes are very flexible. Flexible in terms of the use, not so much in placement and design and uh, 
situation of the building, situated the building. Is it, that, that, that is one example, and I would say we've actually worked with some communities where it's just the opposite, to where the flexibility is, is built in with the buildings themselves, as far as where you're placing all the property, as well as some of the uses. Anybody uh, else on form-based codes versus traditional codes? Which ones do you like? Got to make a decision here for some. John. Florida Trend just had a big issue on the design of downtowns, including Tampa and some others. And it's funny, just like two days ago, I was reading about that and how they're revamping even major shopping centers to do more flexibility. So, form based codes. Florida Trend Magazine is my Bible. Okay. Good. Anybody else? Yeah, well, form based code and the flexibility from my economic developers at. Sounds uh, like it certainly has more uh, potential for marketability and creativity and free market. Um, I guess from my city bureaucrat hat, it, it is, how do you manage that and how do you decide what gets approved and, and where, where does that fall? How does the city council make a decision on a form based code approval when it's all creative and put together on masking and all the public's coming in and they're asking questions and all of that. Good question. The biggest thing when you make a determination is does it fit? You know, I totally agree it has to you have to be flexible. Things are changing all the time. But the driving force, like Luke said at the outset, is the quality of life. Does it match what's in the area? Or is you going to have this albatross that say it doesn't fit? <coughs>
what type of code are you familiar with their code? Do you know? I've looked at theirs, I've looked at Bridge Parks, I've looked at Maitland's, I've looked at Orlando's, I've looked at Zephyr Hills, I've looked all over the country. There's over 300 plus communities with formal state codes. We've actually written with quite a few of those ourselves. So those are form based codes. There's a they lot are of, all very unique and they are all thriving. And keep in mind, we're not saying that, and again, we're specifically identifying it for the mixed use areas. We're not saying citywide. To the contrary, the last thing you want to do is to a place. We, we can have a whole session on the form based code, which we don't have time today, but form based code should be specific, targeted areas. And there needs to be a specific set of processes that you go through to identify what's the review process, what are the standards as far as what's going to be code, who's got the review authority, and kind of get that <coughs> expectation moving forward. And does this group see any value in form based codes in a targeted and specific area in the city of Tavares? Yes. yes. Okay, so you're hearing that it's yeah. worth looking at and discussing a targeted area in the city for form based codes. The, the form based code include a park? The <laughs> form based code include the park? Yes. That far is too low. Yes, absolutely. And well, these are the questions we wanted to ask you all today. Be 2.0 or more. All right, Denise Lorado. Do form-based codes, are they consistent with what's in the master plan? As, which master plan? The downtown master plan. It was adopted by the The downtown area. master plan informs the code. So we'll have to use that master plan to develop the form-based codes. If you do a form-based code district in your downtown, you're going to probably have to update the downtown master plan. Talk about architecture, uh, colors, I mean, muted colors, and all that. The community already decided that they want it downtown. So, yeah. you know, you may have to revise that. That's a very that. good point. Does form based code do any sense if you're prescriptive on colors and stuff? So right now, I recall that Main Street would have five story buildings, right? According to the master plan. 60 feet. Yeah. Yeah. And minimal parking requirements because we're set up. Right. The short no. answer is no. Right. Short answer is no. I don't think it should. It should be up to the developer. The, he's going to make an attractive product. There again, yeah. the city, the when they're developing their code, they start dictating colors. I mean, the county just did the day. They want to dictate the colors. They want to dictate the design standards. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you can do that. But it's not a, nothing is automatic from a form based code. Period. All right, so we're spending a lot of time on form-based versus traditional, and what we're hearing is form-based in a targeted area is something the city council should discuss and many of the community should. Go ahead and just need, to, just need to focus on that. So, we've got the notes, we've got some information on that. So, one of the things that we wanted to also throw out uh, to, to this group here is, you know, when you see a lot of intensity and intensity, a lot of people automatically think, oh, I get to do the maximum. One of the things that you have to keep in the back of your mind is, does the land support that level of development? Do you have enough water? Do you have enough sewer? Do you have transportation? So one of the things, and actually it's in part of your comp plan right now that we wanted to call it out is, just because there is an up to 25 or an up to 2.0, there may be limitations on those standards because of a lack of infrastructure or other things. So keep that in the back of your mind as well as you're hearing some of these standards up. Some people may hear 2.0 and automatically go, I don't know, but no, we don't want 2.0 across the city. And again, we're not saying across the city, we're saying in certain areas, and where those areas are is where the increased availability of infrastructure may be. So this is one of those things that we were asked and tasked to do, which was come up with that transition between what's in the county versus what's in the city. Certain areas to say, you know, what the county allows versus what the city allows are literally like oil and water. And Mike and I have been talking through a bunch of things. Give me a take Mike with you. Uh, to say, what is that transition in certain areas that makes sense? So Mike, kind of walk us through a residential estate. Right, so like Kelly said, in our discussions with uh, internally with the city staff, and it's coming out of some of the public meetings, this is what we're kind of proposing for 
areas that are um, currently um, within the ISBA but not in, within the city limits um, with some particular guidance um, as it relates to annexation. So, um, what hold we on, hold on, hold on. Yes, sir. All right. Interlocal service boundary area. Does anybody need an explanation of what an ISBA is? Or do you have it down? No. You good? Yeah. Go ahead, explain All it. All right, so it, here's the city, okay? And that is the incorporated area today. Then there's a circle around the city that's Lake County. And then there's Mount Dora, Eustis, Leesburg, and Howie the Hills, and Ashtatua. The city negotiated an agreement with all of these cities and Lake County as to where the future boundary of Tiberias will be forever. And that is called an SBA, <coughs> and there's a map, and it goes around, and it shows where the city can grow, or annex is the word they use, into that area. This city currently does voluntary annexation only. You only annex into the city if you, the private property owner, want to. The only reason people usually want to annex their private property to the city is because they need water and sewer. Lake County does not provide water and sewer. Cities do, not the county. So we have this circle where we all agree in an agreement where all cities signed it, Lake County signed it, we signed it, and said that is as far as you're going to grow, Tiberius, on a voluntary basis. What they're about to discuss is what should the zoning be there, or what should the land use be there? Should it be rural estate land use, horses and million dollar homes and five acre lots? Should it be one and a half acre lots? What should it be out there? Because when somebody says, I want to annex into the city, we're going to say, no problem, we have a comp plan, and it says you got to have a five-acre lot or a ten-acre lot. Go ahead. I'm sorry, is that uh, the map right there? Yeah, that actually does. Yeah, those are the, those are the yeah, zoning and future lands. lands. Oh, is this the blue line? Yeah. That's the blue line. Yes. So this blue line... Goes out to Deer Island, takes on Squirrel Point, takes all of this area, goes down to um, the Astatula down here. Yeah. This area stops at the Howie Bridge, goes out to uh, Leesburg. Here's an area that's not in the city, but Leesburg said you can have that if they ever want to annex in. Goes along here, goes out by the hospital. This is uh, Avalon and the new school and the new development out there. Uh, goes kind of out by uh, Bay Road. So, so Bay Road on Old 441 is as far as we'll ever go. Most of this is in the county. And then uh, Mount Dora has agreed that they'll only go to Bay Road. And Eustace has agreed to only go to these lines. And Leesburg agreed to go to here, and ask the two of it here. So we've all agreed on this. And the question is, what do you designate the land use in here, 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 and here? And all here, all these county properties, what should it be? Because once we set it, and they want to annex in, we'll say, sure, here's the rules. And you're creating the rules for the city council who's going to let that private property owner know what they can and can no longer do with their property. Great, thanks. And we'll, there's a, a few slides after this, kind of getting into some of the proposed annexation policy language. But for, for right now, we're going to get on that residential estate, which is addressing uh, Mr. Drew's, that southeastern part of the, um, the ISBA, where you have more rural land uses transitioning into more suburban and urban land uses. So, um, so up here what we're proposing is this residential estate future land use. Um, and 
This is something that can be applied when there's lands annexed that are currently have a Lake County rule or rule transition future land use. So this would be a tool to uh, try and reflect and maintain that, that transition and that some of the existing land uses out there. Um, again, this, this, this potential designation would be intended for large lots, single family homes, uh, detached. Um, and we're proposing up to one dwelling unit per acre. We've got a question. Yes. So how these areas that we would add, right, that are five acres an acre so on, will they be able to be on well and septic, or are we going to have to be sewer and water? So I want to go ahead and jump ahead to a couple of slides because that's a great segue to kind of what we're talking about, uh, both from compatibility, but more importantly, annexation should be at the will of the city. If it's not financially feasible, if you've got to run a sewer line three miles out of Surf One, it's not it's not economically it's not responsible. The general policy today is that in order to annex into the city, you must connect to water and sewer. Right. Whether the city council maintains that into the future uh, is up to the city council. But today, if you want to annex into the sewer into the city, you got to plug into our water and our sewer then we have to evaluate whether it's worth driving a garbage truck all the way out to your property, <laughs> a police officer all the way out to your property, it's like Shakespeare. a uh, fire truck and all of that. And so we look at it and we either make a recommendation or a council, it's either going to cost us a lot of money to do that or we can do it and it's not that much. But the policy right now is you got to connect to water and sewer and the city must be able to provide you services, garbage, police, and fire, um, at a reasonable uh, cost. Uh, and we've had one or two exceptions where we sometimes say, at such time as sewer is available, but that's a rare thing that the council decides. Who pays for those line extensions? Generally, the um, developer pays for their line extensions in the form of an impact fee, and then that money is used to bring the line out to that housing project. That's a great question. So, Luke, can we go back to kind of wrap that up? Just because somebody has to be annexed doesn't mean that the city has to. And, oh, by the way, if you're going to get annexed, you've got to meet certain standards to, to come in at that point. So the whole thing is trying to be as fiscally responsible as we can, especially for the city. John, do you have to be contiguous if you're in the ISBA? Very good question. You do not have to be contiguous to annex into the city. So, great questions on the annexation and that rule of state. One thing I would say is we're, we're trying to build in some provisions for that state type of thinking where, you know, you can't go above a one house per acre, but you've got to meet certain standards, whether it's open space or buffers or other things. So, uh, we're, we're building in a lot of those protections as well. And that kind of gets into compatibility. Uh, and we'll go through uh, compatibility and get, get into mobility here in just a second. But one of the things as the city is looking at land use decisions, they should be looking at a variety of things. And one of the things we said was, okay, let's, get, let's give you all a buffet list of how do you define compatibility? What are the things that kind of should be discussed, maybe included, or all of that? And basically, what we've done here is to say, you know, the city needs to look at a lot of different things. Now, we're not saying you have to check the box on every single one of those because every situation is different, but these are the tools that you can use in judging if it's compatible or not compatible. And there again, we're not saying all of these have to be there, but those are the factors that you kind of think about as you're moving forward. Yes, John? So, great question. He's talked about state zoning and the ISBA. How do you feel about that? Do you think that the city ought to adopt a state zoning? You talked about rural character, character of the community. In this area that's way out here, should the city adopt a state zoning, big house with lots of acres, in 
this area or not. Some communities say, that's a good idea. Bob? That the developer can develop 
and he's going to drive it because if he can't build something that he's going to make his money back on, he's going to walk away from the deal and then the and then the homeowner property is <coughs> stuck with it. So use the flexibility of yes, a state. No, not a state, because you all that area out there is a mixture. Well, of I mean, the question you're going to you're asking, we're asking you is, do you want an area in your city somewhere that's a state zoning? I lived in Naples. I saw it. It's usually further away from the urban area. They passed the law, a state zoning. What happened in the estate zoning? Bigger houses, not mega houses. Uh, and then usually maybe a horse or maybe um, you know a, an ATV, a little bit of a bigger. Uh, I think there were three acres in that area. Worked pretty good down there. I'm not sure that's going to work here good. Maybe it will work here, but a decision has to be made. There are some people that live out in that area who have said they would like to see larger lots. They come to the city council meetings. They say, "Come on, please, 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 don't let these small lots." There are others who say, "This is my private property." And I have the right to do what the market is looking for, and the market's looking for smaller lots. Do you want to have a pocket or an area of a state zone? Anybody else? Go ahead. I would like to have a pocket or area of the state zoning. I think it's beautiful drive through there. I also think that's a major artery getting people into uh, our area from the 429 um, in the morning and afternoon. Coming through there is, I mean, it, there's a lot of people coming in here. Um, and if that gets built up, that area, I mean, that, I mean, we'd have to expand transportation there too because that is a major artery for, uh, at the very end, from the 49 people who, you know, a family member who works down in Orlando and one who works here and it's not convenient for them to move here, their entire family. There's a lot of people and money for the city coming in and out of that road right there. Um, and I believe if we get, got too dense, it would cause problems for you know, those people, their housing, their employment. So we've got some folks that say, look at estate zoning out in the area, and others that say, be careful, not sure, maybe not. Freddie, any thoughts in, in this area? Yeah, there's over in the area, I have a grew up in East of that, right next door almost, and he's real estate, he sold a piece of property on Willow Lakes over there. And, uh, they spent a lot of money on the property, and there was a big fight and a lot of litigation on how many they can build. So I understand where the decision has, needs to be made now because right, there's a lot of battle with people who have smaller homes that don't want any more smaller homes. They want, uh, want over here, over here. We saw this out here, right? We've got really small lots in Squirrel Point, pretty small lots in Deer Island, Real small lots along here and here, and these people with their small lots came to our city council meeting and said, no more small lots, we want large lots. And the council was like, we need guidance, we need guidance. Wouldn't it be cool if we had a comprehensive plan that addressed all of that through a committee that took care of this and we'll look to that. And that's what you're doing today. You're, you're helping the future councils of Tiberi's have a map and a guidance. Uh, so what, you know, I know we need to move on, but what I'm hearing here is some folks are concerned about a state zoning in that area. Some folks would like to see it. It's going to have to be vetted out. It'll go to the P&Z board. It'll then go to the city council, and then this decision has to be made. Do you want to uh, keep a rural character in between those areas, or no? Or do you want a pocket? Uh, I didn't mean to that's just one last point. There are two sections of Deer Island where you do have to stay home. You're not allowed to build a small house. That was market driven, though, by the developer. That's right. And that's but it is a mixed be market driven by the developer. How big is the lot? It's, it's bigger than a normal one because you've got some monster really houses in there. They're, time, they're, they're, they, they're not even half acre lots, are they? Quarter yeah, acre. Well, yeah, well, 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 a lot of it is wetlands out back. Exactly. Well, let's water. not forget about the quality of the water when you start putting a million homes in an area of the well, And that's what you're going to have out there. That is the area that's developed. But just, just to your point, though, is you have mega houses on the bigger lots that are that are close to the lakes, and then you have the smaller ones that encompass inside. I mean, there's a difference between a big lot and a state zoning. A state zoning is acres. You know, we're talking three, five acres. 
Big lots, little lots, market size, bigger lots, little lots. If that existed, you couldn't build your island. If that existed, you couldn't build the island. Right. So, something to think about. Future council's going to have to wrestle with it. Do you want to stay zoning out there or don't? You only get to make the decision once. Some will say no, some will say yes, some will say maybe, some will say I don't know. Somebody needs to make the decision. All right. So move on, but very important stuff. You can see once you make this decision, it helps the council make decisions. So what we can kind of dogpile on that last thing of the discussion is you know, having the real and single Kentucky horse country. One of the four tools that we use as it is the true horse country, not the South Carolina horse country. Especially because that is somebody's 401 case in the outfit. They've got 100 acres. You know, they've been farming, they've been raising horses, they've been doing whatever. That is their 401 case. So one of the things that we looked at was allow for the three quarter acre to an acre lot, the remaining portion of that. So literally, like 60, 50 to 60% of the, of the property was set aside and they continued their agricultural operation. So they were able to sell off development. Uh, potential. So Head west on East Caroline Street toward North New Haven. And retain their ag use. Uh, and it, it actually worked brilliantly because that 401k that just got replenished. And they weren't trying to figure out, well, what do I do? How do I sell this? Because the alternative is cut up in five acres and hope that somebody's going to buy a five acre lot. So with that, uh, we talked about, I, I love this, by the way. Your seaplane is, is such an asset. You've got to protect it. State statute says you've got to protect it. We're incorporating it into multiple elements because it is an economic driver and a community and cultural focal point of the city. What will you? Mike, did you have your hand up? I was just going to say that uh, the estate zoning would tie into uh, open space, which is on our agenda, recreation and open space element, and uh, if, we, if we can get there, we'll discuss open space. You want to jump to that now? We, we, we can actually get there because he's all about 10 to 15 minutes max. Okay, we'll take the 10. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, the mobility element, that's what you have in your current comp plan today as a transportation element. Mobility is kind of a suggested title change, and we'll talk about why that is. Some of the centerpieces that we're proposing for change and what we want to hear back from you guys on today is, uh, you know, that title change. We have some tweaks to the roadway level service standards that we're suggesting. Uh, the addition of some bicycle and pedestrian level service standards that are not in your code today, or in your complaint today, or your code. Uh, the downtown connectivity element, um, that's kind of a softball for us because you guys did such a great job with the downtown master plan two years ago. Uh, complete streets is kind of an element of a way of place making in your city. And then trails as uh, an extension of your mobility system, not just for recreation. So, that term mobility has become kind of a catchphrase throughout Florida because of the, the state of growth management laws that you now have to reside by. Um, is, so what we're, what we're anticipating to do in this element, and hoping to hear some feedback from you, is change the mindset from transportation to mobility. And what that means, you know, prior to this most recent growth management act, uh, Florida operated with very stringent requirements for how you had to deal with vehicular capacity on the roadways. And hey, maybe you should do bike, head, transit, other stuff, but it wasn't really at the forefront. Uh, mobility is kind of the mindset that let's not prioritize vehicles, let's kind of bring it up to the same level as the other modes that you have available as a means of place making, as a means of uh, economic growth in downtown areas. Um, to tie it more closely to future land use, you can think of a mobility system as an extension of what you're trying to accomplish with your future land use in place making. So to that end, uh, the comp plan would rely, or we're proposing anyway, for it to rely more on a multimodal framework of improvements and coordination with future land use goals and place making. Uh, we're talking about walkable, bikeable, livable communities with transit options and the introduction of level of service standards that just aren't tied to parks. Uh, and and the, 
the trails are very important. You know, we've heard this time and time again at these workshops. Everybody in the city loves their trails. They love their open spaces. They think of them as an extension of their civic facilities. Uh, but in the golf carts, people love their golf carts. We've had a lot of talk about that. NED is an acronym you may have not seen. That's the neighborhood electric vehicle. And the reason we want to incorporate that in your comprehensive plan is because there are or statutes that now refer to NEV specifically. So that trail system as a means of your mobility uh, system is, is something to think about. So in your comprehensive plan, that second column is how you treat level of service for vehicles today. You just say, if it's an arterial, if it's a collector, if it's a major or minor, let's just give it a level of service to be. Um, back up a little bit about what level of service is, you can think of it as a qualitative measure of how you're doing relative to the capacity that you have on the roadway. So just like, you know, grade school A, that you're doing great, but maybe you studied a little bit too hard, you weren't very efficient. And then F, you, you didn't study enough, you're not doing very well. E, level of service E is kind of the, the capacity for the roadway, so keep in mind if you're doing A, you probably built the road too wide. If you're, if you're doing F, you didn't build the road enough. What we would propose to do, and, and this is being done in a lot of other cities that are kind of forward thinking, like Winter Park and like the Garden, uh, is to think of collectors in terms of, you know what, we, we don't need to maintain collector roadways that run through the downtown especially as just another road and we're going to maintain that low surface D. Let's lower the standard here because there may be other things that you want to do with those roads aside from widening it. Um, you may want to install wider sidewalks or you may want to install bike lanes where there are none today. Any, any, anybody have any thoughts about just kind of adopting a lower level of service for vehicles on collector roads and really prioritizing materials for, for vehicles more? So one of the biggest complaints the city council gets is all the roads don't have enough capacity to handle the traffic, right? And then we get a professional engineer and they're like, you're at an A, a B, a C. I mean, you're doing great. But the resident sits there and says, I had to wait for a light once or twice. Unacceptable. Three times. So this is a big deal because in an urban city, huge urban city, uh, slow, you know, you, you, you're used to sitting there going traffic light twice, sometimes three times. Acceptable. In Lake County, not so acceptable. So what he's asked you is, do you want to lower the road capacity, forcing people on the sidewalks and using other things, or not? That's if I was communist. a city manager That's in a, a large city, approach. I'd probably say, that's not a bad idea. But I'm in Lake County, and I've been here a long time, and I've seen how people feel about it. So quick input. Do you want to lower your road level so it's a little more traffic? Might have to wait a light or two? Or not? But That just can't, I mean, you know, come on, man. That just doesn't even sound right. Okay. Make the road's worse. Thank you. You're going to get us killed. All right. <laughs> Robert? <laughs> <laughs> More business uh, attorneys. The problem we have here is most of our most of our roads belong to the county. Okay. They're not city, and people don't understand that. They complain to the council about their roads. They don't know. That's why we should change That's our road signs to blue instead of green, and then you instantly. They don't understand. They're not How do you roads. feel if we had input on county roads and we asked them to lower the level Won't so happen. that we can get people <laughs> off the roads and use another modes of transportation? They would probably be happy as long as they don't have to fix them. They already love them themselves on <laughs> <laughs> So I think the general input here is you have asked if it's okay if we lower the level, service level road to be more multimodal. And I think in Lake County that could be a problem, is what I'm hearing. Correct. Go ahead. And, and just to bring that. To full clarification, we're not anticipating, uh, well, we're not, we're not proposing Lake County uh, roadways to become uh, less restrictive. We're talking about the collector roadways that the city maintains. Um, 
So this is also a financial decision. Do you want to widen roads or do you want to add sidewalks where we're talking about local collector roads? Yes, sir. I really think that traffic engineers are way too narrow-minded about things. In 168 hour a week, roughly 28 hours or so, over five hours a day for five days, is peak hour. And everything else, the 140 hours, is somewhere on the spectrum of off peak. It seems to me that there ought to be much more accommodation for driver discretion, such as flashing yellow and red lights, yield signs instead of stop signs, and fewer. Um, I'm, I'm originally from Michigan. They use uh, a lot of Michigan lefts up there where there's no left turn in the intersection. You go down the block and you pull a safe U turn and then a right. You never stop. You get there quicker because you don't have to sit through three cycles of lights because of the left turning lane. And I think that engineers are way too narrow minded in their view of things, especially off peak. Great comments. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Uh, I'll just say, you know, and I come from a conservative viewpoint, what you're talking about is the APA standards that have flowed through from the common, from uh, Agenda 21 and Agenda 2030 and trying to reduce vehicle traffic, denying vehicle choice to go places so that you can stack and pack people. And I just uh, speak out against it because I don't think that's appropriate. Uh, and the People like having the freedom of being able to go places. They don't like having restrictions on their vehicles. Uh, maybe you add some ways for them to use golf carts as an alternative, but uh, the, the things that I've seen already where you start to move to smart streets and you reduce the number of lanes so that you can put a bike trail that nobody uses, I just don't think I'm speaking up and just saying there is an alternate viewpoint. And I think the land planners typically are skewing towards trying to stack and pack people. And I think that there's just a lot of people don't understand that. They don't follow it. But I happen to be one that does. Yes, sir. Well, additionally, Florida's not really a place where you can get by like a bicycle. It's hard to go to work and come back to work because Florida's hot 10 months out of the year and so you show up not really in a condition to work. In some places it works really well. I was just thinking about if I got myself to my office to do the things I need to do for the rest of the day, not using a, a vehicle. I can probably get lunch, but I'd be eating at the same place pretty much every day. Following that, to, I, I like to go to the gym at lunchtime. To get there, I'd have to use a bicycle, shower, show up back, not in any condition to work. I, I really need my truck, even for just a general work day. To, to do the things that I need to do um, with the quality of life that I have. And so I don't know if, you know, a bicycle is great for activity and exercise here, but I think to get to and from work is very difficult um, just based upon the climate. <coughs> Two kind of takeaways from what we're talking about here is one, we're not talking about taking cars off the roads or doing that. We're talking about creating options. And oh, by the way, DOT basically says thou shalt in some of these cases, so we've got to kind of work within that. But do you know how much it is for the level one to change roughly? Well, what we're talking about when we're talking about going from the level service D to an E, we're talking about a reduction in the standard of like less than 10%. So moving forward and kind of expand upon that mobility framework, um, you have in your complaint today that these are the standards for vehicles. For pedestrian, for bicycle, there are no standards. For transit, there is no standard. Um, if the city is so inclined to go towards this mobility mindset, um, would you like to have something in your conference plan that now has the city accountable to making sure that there's a certain amount of sidewalks that exist in the city to accommodate for that walkability? There's a certain uh, movement towards bicycle lanes, maybe not the road, but at least a network where you have a grid system of east to west. And then uh, also transit, I know the city doesn't do much transit, so we wouldn't incorporate that, but to advocate for it when, when the residents of the city are saying we're really lacking a transit option on you know, this, this route. Thoughts? So I think what you just said was, do we want to make sure that all development has sidewalks? 
sidewalks are really important and that they're put on both sides of the streets and they're really important, that kind of stuff? Or do you want it in a targeted area that sidewalks are more in the urban setting? Or do we want to require all developers to have sidewalks? What's our view on sidewalks? Thoughts, sidewalks. Yeah. We're appropriate in the more densely packed area, the urban core. Um, definitely uh, important, I think. Uh, we're in that walkable area. But again, it's making a second note here is such that nobody's going to really be walking long distances. And so we don't have to necessarily have that connectivity from the, the neighborhoods outside of the core to the So sidewalks to nowhere are. Um, an issue. I think we saw a sidewalk built along State Road 19, goes all the way down and it goes to the middle school. And the thought was, put a sidewalk down State Road 19, get it to the middle school, because we're not going to trust children anymore, we want them to walk, so we're going to get sidewalks, and then you drive down there and you see, how many people are using that sidewalk? One or you two. You drive there all the time. One I, or two, rarely. I see frequently. I see people on that sidewalk. You say one or two. You say frequently. Yeah, especially the kids walking to school, back and forth. Kids to walking to school. Okay, so side sidewalks along that. You hearing good, bad, Robert? Yep. Sidewalks. Clarify two sidewalks within two miles of the schools. That's the issue, and uh, the school districts have moved because they've cut down on the busing. And where so that's the schools, probably the schools are way out here and way. Middle schools, right? Where are they no, putting them now? Just an elementary school going way out Woodley. They used to put them in an urban area. Now they put them out in the rural area. Just a two-mile radius because that's where the state won't pay for the school busing. And that's the issue with the school district since I've been at their board meetings. And so that's when they ran out of money. They cut doing that, supplying buses for that two-mile radius. And then it came out that the kids were walking in grass and everything else. Yep. So now they're all putting in sidewalks in that two-mile radius because it's a busing issue. But that is probably a different issue, and now they're starting to require it for it when they have the schools, which is so probably a good thing. So connecting neighborhoods to schools with sidewalks is a good thing. Thoughts? Sidewalks in an urban area, probably a good thing. Anything else on sidewalks? Yeah, they have the sidewalks because more and more people, I can tell you when I'm out there driving around, more and more people are walking. Yeah. And where are they walking? They're walking on a sidewalk. They don't want them walking in the streets. So if you're building new areas, put the sidewalks in. People will use it. You don't want these people walking in the streets. Whether you're near a school or not, put the sidewalk in there where you have all these houses being put together because they're People walk their pets, and people walk themselves. Right. Tell me what you meant by hold the city accountable for sidewalks. <laughs> so the comp plan holds the city accountable for the pedestrian capacity on the roadway, and when they're filling their level service D on these roadways, you as the city have to say, well, this is how we're going to deal with this, or this is how we're going to address the perceived capacity deficiency. So you don't have anything like that in your comp plan today for sidewalks, for bicycles. Like to be holding the city accountable to making sure that whatever policy that they adopt about sidewalks, I'm not breaking this all the way down to the code level, but in, in a general area, would you want to maintain an area of a sidewalk level service D that has 85% coverage of sidewalks, for example? Hold the city accountable to sidewalks? Yes, no? I think there needs to be a little flexibility. And we're appropriate, where the funds are available, where you think the demand will be. I was going to talk about it, you know, we need to make rules, they attach with dollars, dollars come from the taxpayers, and that's a problem, we need to be able to pay with options. Yeah. And, and keep in mind, I'm going to keep up on what you said, Lou, because the higher you put that standard, yeah. transportation standard, means that somebody's got to build that extra lane, and the lane mileage yep. uh, is uh, over standards here. Sorry about the 10 minutes you said. It <laughs> was. <laughs> I just want to say we're talking, about, we're talking about a level of service guide for development. It doesn't mean that once this is adopted, 
the city's already on the hook for millions of dollars for sidewalks. And this is a level of service guide in our comp plan. But it's for the next 20 years, so we've got to be responsible in that. Yes. We'll... But then the ordinance is the LDR is based upon that. Oh, it all starts to build up. Right You're very correct. Uh -huh. And then the developer has to put the sidewalks in, and then the cost goes up, and it's da, 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 da. so very good conversation. Keep going. I don't mean to slow you down, but this is good stuff. <laughs> yeah, and, and just to, on your point, you know, the sidewalks can replace the road passes. That's not necessarily a more expensive option. It is a more holistic option for the poor. Uh, downtown connectivity. I'll go fast with this one because you guys did a magnificent job back in 2017 with your downtown master plan. All we are proposing to do is incorporate some of those strategies that came out of that into the comprehensive plan moving forward. Uh, complete streets, there uh, you go. not to dwell too much longer on the mobility, but this is kind of like an action that you can take as part of the toolbox and the mobility to identify a certain area that you would have X amount of right away. What do you want to do with that right away? Do you want that to be a more walkable place? This is like a case-by-case -case unique place-making tool that we can incorporate as an option to widening roads, you can do a complete street treatment instead. I lived in College Park years ago. They had four lanes of through traffic going to each way. A lot of rear end collisions with people who were trying to make a left. So they get, did a road diet, created some bike lanes, created two through lanes, and a center painted turn lane. And the business thrived. And I think that's what, you, what people want to live near is an activity center like that. And so to the extent that you can reshape some streets so as to bring about more viability for retail and restaurant and activities, uh, it's, that's a good planning practice. And I'd also like to pass on, Craig Usler once told me that there was no way in 2011 when he was figuring out to create a village downtown Orlando, what people would want in terms of apartment sizes and this and that in 2019. This is a 20-year plan, so build in some flexibility because we don't know where it's going. Things such as scooters, they're coming, no question. <laughs> and you don't get sweaty riding a scooter. <laughs> and the Greta Village example is great. That's the, you know, basically the southwest quadrant of downtown Orlando that's got the new UCF downtown area. Uh, I was actually... Uh, uh, he was my client, Craig Usler, when he was developing that. We did a whole mobility treatment of that, and there wasn't any discussion about vehicle capacity in that area because really, who cares? It's about safety and all the pedestrian activity that's going to happen in the downtown area, the Shiro bike lanes, to make that a true, I mean, some rail station is right there. So that's what we're talking about in the right place, obviously. This is a, this is a treatment to get those businesses to thrive where it makes sense. And then just the Trails Network, again, your residents are really passionate about the trails. Um, we, we would want to kind of elaborate on what those trails are doing in terms of a full mobility system. Uh, we think of trails as recreation. You know, a trail is also a way to get around as well. Um, if you live next to a trail like the Winter Garden that runs right through downtown, um, you're, you're going to park your car and you're going to go downtown to the restaurant. It, it is taking cars off the road when done right. Um, so just to that extent that we want to encourage those trails and we want to, you know, where there's a roadway widening happening to a trail, maybe we don't do that. Maybe we just say, you know, trails there, let's just treat the trail, make sure that it's connected. Uh, this is actually Lake County's uh, master plan for all the trails coming to the area. Uh, we want to we stay behind the travel lead, trap door, just keep that momentum going residents surely love the trail system and are excited about what's coming. That's mobility <coughs> element. Uh, where we're at right now, the next step would be to go into the goals, effects, and policies. Any other comments about mobility? Okay. So we're going to spend a few minutes on recreation, kind of tying the land use, uh, mobility, and also some of the open space components all together in the next 10 plus minutes. So, Mike. No, you got to stay for a So James is uh, special trails here to get you to stay for the whole thing. Um, you'll be quiet now. Part of me, you'll fast because I think we'll probably want to leave a few minutes before we hit 130 for any final wrap up or, or questions. So, um, recreation, open space element of your comprehensive plan. So, here's the center pieces. Um, I might have to blaze through a couple of years, but. Uh, so basically, this is going to be a new chapter uh, element in the comprehensive plan. Uh, currently
currently there are some policies related to recreation um, and other elements. What we're doing is repackaging those and adding uh, additional uh, goals and objectives and policies related to recreation and open space. Uh, Parks Recreation and Open Space Master Plan. Uh, the city has one from 2008, but part of this process and, and part of the complaint is putting in a recommendation that the city updates that um, by a target year of uh, 2025. Um, accessibility and universal design is something to be considered in, um, in new recreation facilities or updating existing ones. Um, relationship with the city's economic development strategy, uh, recreation open space is actually called out there as, as something that, um, that supports uh, things like ecotourism, sports tourism, so on and so forth. Um, like Kelly said, there's a good link between uh, this and uh, land use and uh, mobility. So like I said, we're repackaging uh, rec and open space into its own element. This is required by a Florida statute as listed there. Uh, and like I said, we're kind of aggregating stuff into its own separate chapter. Quick question. Yes, sir. I've been told that the Berries has more parks and recreation uh, per capita than probably every, any city in the state of Florida. You guys do this all the time. I wouldn't mind if you guys looked at that and just kind of just tell us where are we in the world of parks and recreation. If it's true that we have more parks, you know, for a city of our size, I think the residents need to know that because uh, it's good information. Thank you. So, perfect question because we looked at what you currently have on the books as far as existing parks and your level of service standards. You are exceeding what you, you've got more parks and recreation opportunities than, uh, than your population needs for at least the next 50, 60 plus years. You are well above the standard as far as that's concerned. Now, somebody had actually asked us, well, we've got some of these larger areas that have preserves and things like that. Even if you pull those areas that are also kind of those preservation areas, <coughs> areas out and just look at what's active, you still are exceeding all of your standards. Through it, you know, what do we look at? Well, at least through the next short term. So that's, that's just looking at active, active acreage. So cities exceeding its adopted level of service right now and projected to do so if nothing changes. So we have. So we're doing well with our park standards, and how well do those park standards? How long have the parks, and how well do they serve our population? We're doing well with that as well. That's where the, the uh, new park and parks master plan would come into play as well, because their standard is look at how many tennis courts per thousand people. We've actually been working in a number of communities where you're getting away from that level of the standard, and you're going to different definitions and Pickleball courts! <laughs> yes. yeah, the, the NASCAR tracks. Because when a lot of complaints were done, Not enough NASCAR tracks. So now some people go, well, we've got, we've got to have four pickleball courts per thousand people. No. Define what is in a neighborhood park. Here's the options and set it up in a tiered type of system. Make it more flexible. Uh, because what we found out looking through cities, counties, and everybody else's plans, Basketball courts are great, but as your population ages, they're not used. Uh, pickleball courts, most people didn't even think about it back you know, 10, 15 plus years. Our median age is 52 in the city, so again, we got to cater to our population. I will take her. Oh, really? Oh, so I'm getting younger than instead of older. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the one thing I would say as far as the age is 46. I was doing a private development <coughs> in a city where the median age was 76. And in order to meet the level of service standards, I had to put in four basketball courts. Wow. Which yeah. one do you use? <laughs> They're all living to 100, though. Uh, they started using those yeah, courts. You also say, those of them being converted to pickleball all things. Um, but that's where we're saying, you know, create a level of flexibility, look at the master plan, let it kind of inform how you're going in the next 20 years. I think the answer is, land-wise, we're good. What we should do in them, we need to update our master plan for our park system. I can't remember how many years ago we did it, but we did one. We need to probably update it to address your question. Do we have the right number of pickleball courts or softball courts or... 
Yeah. Exactly, and, and, and that's kind of what we're recommending as a policy in the comp plan that the city will update its parks and master plan by date to be determined there, we said 2025. And again, like Kelly said, that would consider alternative driving ranges, golf courses, Frisbee courses. <laughs> so that's that one now. So that planning effort would look at different ways of measuring level of service, classifying your parks, like Kelly said, neighborhood, regional, so on and so forth, to get a more holistic view of what you have. Um, again, we just hit on this level of service. Your one point. Look at that big park in blue with yeah. the seaplanes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, a lot of park. Yeah, you got a lot of acreage there. So, anyway, but like we said, we even took that acreage out to see what would happen. Yeah, you're still. Very, very good. Yeah, so we, we hit on that. The city's exceeding its, its adopted level, level of service uh, standard. Um, right now, we're we'll talking about accessibility, universal design. That's something to consider as you move forward as far as uh, parks and, and recreation facilities uh, accessible to all users. Um, and again, too, uh, what we kind of toy around with is, is in drafting um, the language of the comp plan. For as, as it relates to recreation open spaces, is using your city's assets to promote your adopted economic development strategy to support um, activity at the marina and at the seaplane base, uh, ecotourism opportunities, sports tourism, um, and and using using this expansive <laughs> system to attract visitors and people to the city. Um, like Kelly mentioned before, um, recreation open space is actually very related to your future land use, your mobility. Like James said, your trails should not necessarily be just for recreation. They can get people around. Um, like I just mentioned, your economic development strategy. So all these things are um, connected and that will be reflected within this element of the, um, the comprehensive plan. So we have about five minutes left and we promised you that you would be out of here at one thirty. Um, we will be sending you an email and asking you for more input. So as you marinate and think about this stuff, anything that um, comes to your mind, email it to us. It will become part of the whole thing. We're at this point now where we're really at five minutes for questions and answers. And we're going to be here for a while, so those that have work, other commitments, by all means, please do that. We're going to stay here and talk for a little bit longer and try to answer some questions. Okay. So while we have four minutes left, are there any questions that you have? Any suggestions? Any anything at all? Go ahead. You still have an address, and I brought this up in a couple of meetings. Future land use for expansion of new buildings. Part of that goes into the annexation policy. Uh, well, don't, you don't answer the question right now. Put that down there is make sure we address future land use or utility expansion. That's a great one. Any other ones you think we need to be looking at? All right, well, yeah, I do. Um, I attended a Main Streets uh, in, in Orlando, and they also have something called Market Streets smaller and less intense, but clearly the trend these days is that people want to live near an activity center. So to the extent that you can access <coughs> Main Street treatment and market streets that will create uh, places for people to go and do things. Okay, and, and just to build upon that, Sinclair Avenue, you mentioned it, St. Clair <laughs> Avenue, our north-south corridors coming into our community. I hope we pay a little attention to those two corridors because a lot of folks have asked to um, take a look at those as our gateway entrances from the north to the south into the community. St. Clair Avenue and St. Clair Avenue, and it's appropriately planned out for the future. I think what you're talking is more Ruby Street uh, and Main Street. And where is your market street going to be? When, when I got here 12 years ago, the back end or ass end of all the buildings was to the water. And the activity was on Main Street. And working with my city council, we said, what if we flipped it? What if the front of the buildings became on Ruby Street towards the water? And it took us 10 years, but we eventually got there. And 
now Ruby Street is an active entertainment district area, Main Street still, but what we're looking at, where's the markets going to be, where are the restaurants going to be, where are the hotels going to be? It was a lot of work, but we got it done. You were on the board at the time, uh, and it's totally changed the dynamics. So Sinclair, St. Clair, Market Street, Ruby Street, Main Street, what are they going to be and what are they going to look like? All right, again, send your emails. Uh, we're going to send you an email thanking you for being here. If you think of things that we need to look at, let us know. From here, correct me if I'm wrong, we put this all together. We create a draft. Everyone gets a draft. We go to the Planning and Zoning Board, and we say, having taken public input, three or four meetings, having had some committees and some vested people, uh, put there. Here is a draft of your comp plan, and then I won't be cutting you off. You'll be take plenty of time to go through it. The public will have input on the whole thing, and then in theory, the uh, P and Z board adopts it with recommendations. Yes, and then it goes to the city council. There's a two probably public hearings on that, and then they. Tallahassee. Adopt, send it to Tallahassee for comment, and Tallahassee makes sure that our comp plan is in, is compatible with everybody else's comp plan, like roads connect to other cities, and railroad gauges are different sizes, and all the problems of the past, right? And then they say, oh yeah, your railroad gauge is the same size, your roads actually touch each other, and looks good. They don't care so much what you're doing inside, but doing on the connector, and they send it back with their comments. And that goes back to the city council to incorporate the comments, and then the comp plan is adopted, and then the land development regulations are updated to support the comp plan, and then owners of private property who want to build their property go to that guy and say, what can and can I not do? And you say, here are the land development codes, and this is what you can or cannot do in this area, this area, or that area. And then they come to the council and they say, we want to build this, and a bunch of residents come in and say, you can't, you can't, you can't. And then the council says, we have a comp plan, it's consistent with the comp plan. And here is a very important aspect. When a city council denies a project that is consistent with the comp plan and consistent with the land development regulations, and that private owner says, I complied with the comp plan, I complied with the land development regulations, the bunch of people came in and got the council to vote no, what do you think that land development, that landowner is going to do? And do you think he's going to win or lose? Comp plan becomes a legal, uh, a legal tool for landowners to be treated fairly and equitably without the mob ruling at a PNC meeting or a council meeting. Make sense? Can this process address the letter in turn or one of the four I know the state's involved in it. I know we've been talking about it for a long time. I don't think Sinclair is going to develop that quickly if we don't have that term right there. Which means a lot. Which means a lot. Okay. So I, I think, you know, talking about the importance of Sinclair and St. Clair as north-south corridors and putting that into the comp plan, if that's what everybody believes is important, uh, if that gets into the comp plan, then it's really up to the city then to say, hey, our comp plan says this is a major corridor, we would really like a traffic light in this area, and then the state looks at it and says, but you got a traffic light a quarter of a mile this way and a quarter of a mile that way, and our job in the state of Florida is to get you from one side of the state of Florida to the outside without all these lights. And then we have studies, and we have arguments and discussions, and sometimes we win, and sometimes we lose. So the answer to your question is it probably wouldn't answer it directly, but it would lay the framework out for the city to advocate for a light there. I know what the gentleman said about the Michigan left turn where you go down, you, you kill 
three I have to run over in three different lanes. If St. Clair, if Sinclair <coughs> Avenue is ever to be a north-south corridor into the city, it's going to need a light. It's the most direct road to the county complex. Yep. So Good it's point. Sinclair northbound would have to go through 441 and then make a U-turn mm -hmm. to block pass. Well, there'd be a light. Right. There. Yeah, there's, there's a light there. He wants a light there. And he's asking if the comp plan can help with that. I think the answer is yes. I don't think it'll get your light there, but it'll set the framework up. Any other questions? Again, you all took time out of your day, your jobs. Uh, very appreciated. Um, the city is uh, moving forward, and we shaped it today. Thank you.